Welcome to another episode of the Anything Goes podcast. If you're just tuning in, my name is Caitlin Corzen and I oversee Global and Local Mission here at Village Church. For the next few episodes, I am doing a takeover and where we will dive into the nitty gritty of our local and global ministries. Today, I have joining with us Carissa Youssef, who is the Vice President of Philanthropy and Public Engagement at our strategic global partner, Food for the Hungry Canada, FH Canada for short. And I'm super excited to have her on today. We've been partnered with FH Canada for the past five years. We initially started supporting a project in Haiti, and then we've now been supporting a project in Ethiopia. And Chris and I, actually, we first met officially in Haiti three years ago when I came on staff and journeyed there together to go visit um, the project that we were supporting. And it's just been a beautiful friendship that's formed over the past few years. I love your heart and vision for what you do. And so really looking forward to this conversation. So would you just tell us a little bit more about who you are and who FH Canada is? Oh, absolutely. Caitlin, thanks so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation and I'm so grateful for the partnership um, that uh, Village Church has brought to our work first in Haiti and then in Ethiopia. And uh, yeah, just the the like-heartedness of this work together, doing it together is so, so good and so inspiring. As you said, um, my name is Carissa Youssef and I work with uh, Food for the Hungry Canada. Our offices are just in Abbotsford, BC, which is where I live with my husband, Bob, and our two daughters. Um, Alexandria is 10 and Abigail is 8. Um, I've had the privilege of working at Food for the Hungry for almost 14 years and uh, God really um, Oh, he was so kind to me uh, to bring me to this space because it was really um, uh, a vocation where my personal uh, calling and my vocational calling collided. Um, I grew up um, in the States, actually, and I experienced a a period of real vulnerability in my life as a teenager while my dad um, was diagnosed with and then passed away from cancer. And there was just a really, um, it was just a defining period of, of my life for me where I saw God's faithfulness and goodness and kindness to me in how people journeyed alongside of us during that period of vulnerability. We had, um, material need um, as my dad was unemployed at the point where he was diagnosed. And so we relied heavily on our our Mm. church community. And uh, there's a whole story there, which I could share another time. But that experience set deeply in my heart a desire to care for and walk alongside those experiencing vulnerability, um, those experiencing poverty in various stages. I've always had a love for the international community, had the privilege through my church to go on several mission trips, um, which could also be another whole podcast, of course. But um, when I encountered Food for the Hungry and the opportunity to join um, in the in the work um, professionally, uh, it just fit for me. Um, I've in the course of my you know, professional life, realized that the that important work that happens overseas. Um, really needs to be done by local leaders, indigenous leadership. And so my role here in Canada um, in the philanthropy and public engagement sphere is to mobilize Canadians um, and educate them on their capacity to make a difference Mm -hmm. globally. Um, I think that we are called to be generous both here at home uh, and to our our global neighbors. And so um, I just have the privilege, really it is, it's a privilege, it's a joy to be able to um, meet churches, families, businesses across Canada and connect them to the work that Food for the Hungry does. So, Well, we are so grateful to have you and be partners if you you. and get to glean from your experience and your passion, I know, and your teams for sure. And that's actually kind of one of the things, what has it been like to lead in an international organization during a pandemic? Oh man, if can you <laughs> just try to put ourselves back eight months ago and think, you know, how many of us ever imagined that that would be a question asked of us? What is it like to leave in a, lead in a global pandemic? Being part of an international relief and development organization already gives, um, I think, the opportunity to have a bigger perspective than maybe just what's happening here at home. But I think like for so many of us, your instant reaction is uh, sort of how does this affect myself, my family, my neighbors, my staff, what does that look like here? Um, And then the instant follow-up is, oh my goodness, if this is going to be hard for us, 
Mm-hmm. How much harder is it going to be for these families that are already kind of on the edge uh, around the world in the developing community? Uh, so many uh, families around the world earn money to feed themselves for that day. And mm-hmm. things like physical distancing are nearly impossible. Um, access to health care uh, is already so challenging. So I think there was this just instant um, um, feeling of, of helplessness. Um, and then, and then sort of this like surge of resilience saying, no, 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 we are committed to this work. Um, now more than ever, our global neighbors need our support. Um, our, our model of work is to, um, walk alongside whole communities for a a longer period of time. So about 10 years. So the communities that we're working with overseas, um, we have a depth of relationship there. And so our international staff uh, who are on the ground doing this work around the world um, have those relationships with the community leaders. And so they were able to um, adapt from like in-person visits to um, over the phone. Uh, conversations, they prioritized right away um, how to, you know, let's really quickly revisit proper hygiene. How do we wash our hands? Um, Who has access to being able to wash their hands in the community? That, that part, that hygiene part is already part of our regular programming, um, which I'm so grateful for. So it was really just reminders and this education piece that kicked in right away saying, here's here's what physical distancing means. There's, you know, how do we do this in in these settings? Um, So I I was so inspired and impressed by the way that our international staff adapted so quickly um, to be able to meet those needs. In Ethiopia, particularly, um, uh, our staff were really involved with some different kinds of education campaigns, both in uh, kind of urban centers and then rural, which is where food for the hungry typically works is more rural environment. Um, And so to be able to um, uh, distribute PPE and soap and these different things that, you know, to a degree we were all thinking about here at home as well. So that happened right away. Um, You know, borders closed, schools were closed, public gatherings were restricted, very similar experiences. Um, And so that yeah, I really they were able to to respond quite quickly, and and I'm grateful to say that particularly in the communities where we're working in Sasiga, Ethiopia, uh, mm-hmm. families have remained healthy for the most part and are well positioned now um, to continue adapting for the future. Mm-hmm. And I know even at the beginning, the fear of a spread in a close knit community like that, yes. like a lot of the communities that we even support projects around the world. And mm-hmm. with you guys, yeah, if a spread happens, there aren't the medical facilities around. It could be very detrimental to a small rural community. And so that's wonderful that they've been able to yeah. take those measures and keep their community safe. Yes, absolutely. We're so, so grateful that it hasn't been um, as as bad as I think most of us immediately anticipated. Mm-hmm. Um, still a lot of vulnerability in it, but uh, they're being very, very careful moving mm-hmm. forward. Oh, that's so good to hear. Um, and well, you kind of touched on it, the relief versus development. And one of the yeah. great w- reasons we love partnering with you guys is your long-term investment model, where it's the full community transformation that happens at the local level. So raising up local leaders, working with nationals, really to help them transform their own communities. And mm. so, yeah, I think in terms of development, we often think of relief. And so when we do operate in relief, that impacts how we actually go about doing the work. Now, what makes Food for the Hungry different and how do you guys operate in that way, the development side of things? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, we do refer to ourselves as a relief and development organization, and that's predominantly because we were invited into most of the countries where we're working through relief um, encounters. So there may have been civil conflict or a natural disaster where emergency response was necessary, right, to, to, to counter the suffering that had been um, in place. After relief comes a rehabilitation stage where you're trying to get that particular community back to where they were before the crisis took place. So there's still typically um, measures of extreme poverty, but at least the community's back to where they were before. Um, And then typically we're invited to stay in a community to take it to that next level, which is development. 
And that's really just a word that refers to a desire to help a community um, envision for itself a different future. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's it's a long term commitment. Um, We all know change does not happen overnight. And in some of these, um, you know, rural contexts uh, in the developing world, it there's a lot of obstacles to overcome to help them reach that space of sustainability. Mm -hmm. So we typically would work in a community for 10 years and then at the end of that um, have a graduation, which is really just a party to celebrate how far they've come. And it's an acknowledgement, it's a ceremony where um, Food for the Hungry is um, is is leaving to a degree. Mm-hmm. Um, relationally, our staff are still around. We're typically in you know a couple of villages away doing it again. But it's a symbol and a sign of celebration that the community is able, has the resources and the knowledge they need to continue their own development without external resources. So having that kind of an exit strategy was one of the pieces that um, drew me to work at Food for the Hungry. I think it's really respectful um, to not be uh, around forever and to just empower and equip people and their Mm -hmm. God-given skills and roles in a community. So our work is um, long. It's also holistic. So when you walk into a community there may be visual um, sort of needs that you see right away. And a lot of those might be infrastructure, um, but all of our work typically takes place within four pillars, if you will, we'll call them pillars, education, health, Uh, livelihoods, which is income generating activities. A lot of times that's going to be agricultural based um, because we work in rural communities Um, and then disaster risk reduction and leadership development. So there's that resiliency piece where they're going to need to continue the work right after we're gone and disaster is going to strike again. It's inevitable, whether it's a health crisis or a natural disaster, whatever that might be. Um, And so with, you know, when we begin I think one of the things that's most important, I know you and I have chatted a lot about this, is what makes development really important is is how you mm-hmm. you go about kind of even laying out that plan at the beginning. Um, Food for the Hungry has uh, has an approach to development that starts with listening mm-hmm. um, and doing a lot of um, sort of asset audits <laughs> where you go in, instead of saying, what do you need? asking, what do you have? Mm -hmm. Um, I think having a bit of an abundance perspective helps, um, even with this biblical framework that we bring to the development scene Mm -hmm. of believing that God has a plan and a purpose for these communities and that he wants to bless them and that there is enough, um, despite all of the maybe material poverty you see, or the lack of infrastructure, Mm -hmm. um, but to very, very carefully and respectfully get to know a community, get to know what's the root issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is this leads me to a really important question. When you're looking for the root issue in a community, kind of why are they stuck? I think you have to start um, by going back to uh, what I what I would just say is our definition of poverty. Mm-hmm. Can I jump into that? Is that yeah, okay? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and you know what? I first... My big introduction to Food for the Hungry when I was in post-secondary studying international development was through one of your guys' poverty boot camps. So okay. I, that's a key piece of what you guys have really led the way in, I believe, in mm-hmm. across Canada. And yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely dive into kind of what you've seen as the root of poverty. Yeah, that's awesome. We do still offer those workshops too. And it's just for this. It's for this conversation. What is poverty? And um, it totally changed my life when I came to Food for the Hungry, you know, grew up in the church, um, always had this this desire to be involved in, in missions or, or helping ministries, that sort of thing. Um, and when I when I came to Food for the Hungry and I, I kind of bumped into this definition or theological perspective of poverty, it, it just changed everything for me. So at the root of it, uh, Food for the Hungry believes that the, the root cause of poverty is broken relationships. Mm -hmm. Those broken relationships are um, a relationship with God, self, others, and creation. Um, And I think it's so important that we start there because how we define a problem determines our solution to a problem. So if you're defining the problem of poverty as broken relationship, then the solution to that is going to be reconciled relationship, Mm -hmm. which sounds lovely and maybe a little bit theoretical. So how do you tie that in? Um, I think it's, 
it, this definition does three different things. One is that it starts with um, us recognizing that we all experience poverty. Mm -hmm. So it right away strips us of us versus them, or even local versus global. Like poverty is a human problem. Yeah. Poverty is a global problem. Um, so that's one thing that's really important to me. It changes our posture in this work mm -hmm. because um, it's not just now us in the West, um, you know, serving those and maybe say the global South, but it's going to be hey, we are all in this together as local and global neighbors, as brothers and sisters mm -hmm. in Christ. Um, it, changes the dynamic. And I think we have to start there or our work could actually cause a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I think that it, um, it allows us to recognize that some of this work is applicable here in our own lives and in our own neighborhoods. And we can, we can talk about that a little bit later, but I think it also helps us put uh, the people that we're trying to serve, the, the families that we're walking alongside, it helps, it changes the narrative a little bit about what we're looking at when we come into their community looking for poverty. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I think one of the things I've learned that's been such a big lesson to me is that it's really easy to talk about the poor. Um, it's different to engage with the poor and to mm -hmm. listen to their perspective and invite them into the conversation. Um, I know that there's been surveys done that, you know, when you ask people to describe how they feel when they're experiencing poverty, often what they describe is not um, hunger as much as, as much as it's shame, mm -hmm. or it, you know, it may not be a lack of access to education that comes right away to their mind, but it could be um, fear, right? So I think that this definition of poverty also helps reframe the narrative of the work and practically speaking, what that looks like in an international development context, like Food for the Hungry, is that when Food for the Hungry staff arrive in a community and start listening and asking questions about why a community may be experiencing stocks, right? Why are they experiencing this, this kind of poverty? Typically what happens is they'll boil it down to uh, either a belief or an idea that's holding them back. Um, maybe it's a misconception about God or each other. There's a lot of tribal conflict in some of these mm. communities that we work with, and that's true in Sasiga. And sometimes that tribal conflict is really a broken relationship with each other, mm -hmm. right? It's re not recognizing the, the shared humanity in people who are different than us. And so, um, I think you have to start there. You have to recognize that it's not just coming in and saying, oh, you need classrooms or you need a well or, you know, these things that are easy to observe, but to do the work and understand what it, what that core, what that core root issue of poverty might be before you even dream about the future. Definitely. Yeah. And I think we've seen it too before. And it takes time readjusting the, the mindset for that because you still go into places and it's natural to just instantly observe, observe, oh, yes. there's a lack of material. Um, but it's really reframing what actually matters and then what, yeah, how we engage with it. And um, I know for a lot of people and, you know, we formulated some of our global trips and the content that we walk people through before sending them overseas really helps to break down that idea of what material poverty is versus the actual mm -hmm. root of poverty, the broken relationships, because it yeah. impacts how we engage with locals. I think mm -hmm. so often um, we've both seen it in our work is yeah. people will go and you feel like you've accomplished something because you were able to build a well or you were yeah. able to fund a family with food. And then that's your big mm -hmm. check mark for the trip. But oh, really totally. the big win for, I think a lot of the people we visit, the win for them is actually the fact that people were coming to be relational with them. Yes. Um, and so oh, kind yeah, of absolutely. thinking on that, and we've had conversations around this, how does, you know, engaging in mission and global mm. work really impact our own discipleship, especially us in the yeah. West? I think there's a few things that we have to learn. How have you seen that? Oh, that's such a good question. And, you know, right away, what comes to mind for me um, with this conversation around sort of discipleship and missions and that sort of thing is there's this passage in 2 Corinthians 5 that I love so much where we are told that we are Christ's ambassadors and that God is making his appeal 
to the world through us. And it reminds me that we're on mission, like we're on God's mission because <laughs> it, it's easy to check those boxes and say, oh, I've accomplished something or I've done something really, really important. And um, so I think it it's just sort of starts again with that posture piece, like you were saying, where, you know, what is our role in this work? And that's really important. Um, I, I think it's a commitment to long-term transformation where we recognize that there are um, these tangible and sort of intangible things that need to change in our lives and in the, in the lives of people that we're serving overseas where um, we can address a lack of access to education in a community, but what is the underlying belief there that may be holding people back? And it's this idea of, do they believe that their children were made in the image of God and value and, 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 have this intrinsic value and therefore are worth investing into through an education. Um, And those, those, those issues are mirrored right back to us, right? Where, where do our values come through and how is Jesus constantly changing those parts of our heart? You know, you make a commitment to Christ. There's sort of that entry point into following, following Christ and uh, food for the hungry is not a a mission agency. So a lot of the communities where we're working with um, we recognize right away that, that, we're not a proclamation ministry that God is already at work there. A lot of people are already uh, have been introduced to, to Jesus, but it's a discipleship process because there's all these things we need to learn about how to, how to continually transform our lives to look like Jesus. So how we view each other, how we view our children, um, what part of my life is, is needing to still have that transfer. That's discipleship, right? That's what we're constantly doing in our journeys um, as believers. And that's what I see being, um, being modeled so beautifully with our, our FH staff on the ground is just that, that commitment to be in relationship and encourage people to say, Hey, you know, this is what the Bible says, or this is, this is the best way to, um, you know, uh, I'm thinking even something practical, like approaching agriculture through a bit of a biblical framework, right? Uh, there's curriculum that we often use called farming God's way. And it's saying God has given us practical uh, instruction on how to care for creation in a way that creates the best um, yields so that we can feed our families and, and care for, you know, give out of our enough um, to others around us. And, um, often when we're traveling or we're taking teams, you know, you and I've been able to travel together when, when hopefully we can travel again someday, that relationship investment is so important because we have so much to learn Mm -hmm. um, from these families as part of our discipleship journey. So it, it really is a difference between what we plan on delivering and what we plan on experiencing as part of our own transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I like that. It's really just that posture shift and that mindset shift and, how we go in viewing what we're going in to do or yeah. be. Yeah, that learning posture is so key. And if I can say it's way harder. <laughs> I know you've probably experienced that too. It's way harder to take the time away from our families and our jobs to go overseas and not have this big glorious delivery that we get to tell everybody about. <laughs> um, but to come back and say, here's what I learned. Here's what I was taught. Um, here's what I received. I think, um, I think that there's something really beautiful in being able to articulate what we've received from others. And I think that that's even a way that we can model um, following in the way of Jesus is this, this posture of receiving. It's not uh, as easy as it is to give, but to be able to say, Hey, I've received some beautiful, good things in my life because I follow a good and beautiful God and have met some incredible people who continually teach me more about who I am and about who he is. And it just, I feel like it's just kind of flipped it all around for me. And isn't that totally kingdom? It just gets flipped from what we're expecting. And I almost think it's when you go in, we often think that when we're going somewhere, we're going in as the giver, but then allowing someone else to be the giver actually, yes. yeah, what you said, point someone into their inherent worth and what yes. their God-given gifts and abilities. And so they have things to give the world. And so yes. that's that allowing someone else to actually give to you. Um, definitely yeah. challenging, but yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. I think part of where that relationship side comes from as well is when you go and have that posture of learning, when you do end up giving um, something financial or a project, it's actually received on the other end way 
differently than it would have been if you only go in and that's the only thing that you do. I think um, oh, because then so it's so important that you love us and you actually care for us and you've taken time to listen. Um, and then that's where it's received better. And it takes Caitlin, that relationship that's, building, you know, that's why you guys are there for 10 years of building yeah. relationship, yeah. working with that's communities. So critical. Trust. Yeah. Yeah. No, you have brought up a huge, a hugely important piece of this. And I think it's just as applicable here at home. Yeah. I think we have to make space for relationship in order to help well and to help in healthy ways because exactly that when you have a relationship with somebody and you want to help them I mean just I'm sure in your mind right away you're thinking of that friend or that family member that community member where when you're giving something to them out of relationship it it actually kind of um, binds you together even more like it's this sense of community this sense of togetherness this sense of neighborliness Um, but without that it can be so harmful and I know a lot of your um, team trips and team leaders and whatnot have gone through a lot of the material presented in helping without hurting. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's so important because this is something that's really, really easy to overlook. And I'll give you a, an example of my own life that may resonate with people. Um, Cause I think it doesn't matter the context that the, the idea is the same. Um, when my family was going through our period of vulnerability, um, when I was in high school and, uh, we, we went through a couple of Christmases Mm -hmm. and there was two distinct ways that families, um, blessed our family (laughs) during that period of time and great intentions, right? They want you to have Christmas presents. That's an important piece of, of our culture with Christmas. And, um, but I saw two different ways that people did it. Some would come and actually bring us, us as in the the kids, I'm the oldest of four. They bring us the very best gifts that they could that year. I mean, these were things my parents probably wouldn't have bought us anyway, because they were just so amazing. Um, but there was a look in my parents' eyes that I couldn't, I couldn't articulate, um, when those gifts were given to us. Um, and then, you know, later I started to kind of piece it together a little bit that there was a sadness there because they couldn't do that for us. Um, but then there were families who would give my parents money out of relationship in relationship, right? They had that connection to each other and they would say, you buy your kids Christmas presents, Mm -hmm. tiny little shift, right? But one felt really good to the families and to to us as kids, frankly. Right. Um, but (laughs) once the right? (laughs) Great presence, but left out a really important stakeholder to that Mm. scenario, which were my parents, um, versus another one who said, Hey, we're in this together. You know, your kids, you have this God given role as their parents, you go and get your kids what you believe they would want. And that subtle shift has stuck with me so deeply because it's reminded me that in my efforts to help, I can cause harm. Mm. Um, if it's not uh, inclusive of all the people in, you know, sort of in that scenario. And then what can I do differently in my life here? And then, you know, what does that look like on the, you know, on the field, so to speak, as the language that we use in these international contexts, is everybody involved at the table? Are, are those God-given roles being upheld and are people being empowered in that process? And I think that's critical for us as believers to, recognize and then adapt to so that we can, um, help in the healthiest way possible. So good. And that, I mean, especially going into the season where we're running into Christmas time, it's where people are wondering, where can I give to, what gifts can I buy for people? Yeah, It's not to shame anyone. If you've done this in the past, you know, no, not at all. We all mean well. And yeah. yeah, Totally. We, that's not the point of view, but it's that framework of, Oh man, who are we considering? Yeah. I like that. At who yeah. are we, the, all the stakeholders at the table? Um, yeah. just so that we can do it well. And you know, it's honoring, yeah, the mother and the father who really is trying to make ends meet mm-hmm. and, you know, you can actually help them feel like the hero of their family. Yeah, um, exactly. And there's lots of agencies in our communities who are, who are the ones building relationship and they're doing this good work. So like you said, Caitlin, I'm not sharing that story to, no, not, to, to shame anybody, but just to give us a different perspective, yeah. because if you remember at the beginning of our conversation, when we're talking about how people who are experiencing poverty would describe their situation. It's often these, it's an emotive 
uh, conversation, right? And shame and fear or anger or loneliness. And as a, you know, as a 14 and 15 year old walking through my church foyer and seeing my name on the giving tree, it, it, it was, it, I felt shame hmm. and it wasn't, it wasn't my church's fault. They were lovely and, 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 but I think we need to make little changes with how we're walking with people so that we're not amplifying the emotional vulnerability that they're experiencing. Well, Carissa, thank you so much for everything that you've shared today. I know that people have found a value. I sure have. I could listen to you every day. I love our conversation. <laughs> Um, but really, I think what's really beautiful is the model that you guys have had. We've really tried to do that as a church, you know, in our different local partnerships. We've yeah. made sure that we're operating from the place of building relationship with people in the community. And as we get people involved, yes, there's the need for doing some task oriented work in the community. And we fully think yeah. that that's important. But Absolutely. really, with we want to see full community transformation and people yes. reached and empowered and seeing their God-given gifts and abilities. It's really to have that relational mentality. We believe in community within the church. So we believe that our yes. the communities that we're so good at building should be built within the community as well. And even the yes. materials that we um, create for sending teams overseas, it's all built around that model of, yes, the when helping hurts and yes. what is poverty and really getting our teams to think critically so that we can go and serve the best and to be the best partners and visitors and learners. Yes. And so thank you again for your insight. And we really hope that mm -hmm. people are just to go away with from today with a new mindset shift or just a new perspective of how you mm -hmm. can view the world. And so thank you again. And we just so appreciate you guys. Yeah. Thank you, Caitlin. This has been just an honor, a privilege, and we're so proud to be your partner and we're proud of the work that your, uh, your church is doing across Canada and uh, just thankful that we get to do kingdom work together.